Well, it's official. Peter Ridd is taking his case all the way to the High Court of Australia. Uh, today, the High Court agreed to hear Peter's final appeal by giving him special leave to take his case to the High Court. So now, the highest court in the land will consider the very meaning of academic and intellectual freedom for the first time in Australian legal history. So, what does this mean for free speech, free thought, and the fight for an honest conversation on climate change? Well, let's hear from the IPA's Director of Communications, Evan Mulholland, and the Director of the Foundations of Western Civilization Program here at the IPA, Dr. Bella Debrera. Guys, great news. We're going all the way to the High Court. Evan, I'll start with you. Uh, how important is this case? What, what is, what is the, what's at stake here? Well, this is the most important test case for academic freedom in our generation. This is, I believe, the first time yet the High Court has been asked to decide on the issue of academic freedom. That's correct. And it, of course, it was always going to be in the public interest mm. for the High Court to hear this case. You've got mm. a case where a university censored an academic who was speaking out on his area of yeah. expertise. You've got a 30-year academic, highly respected by his students, uh, censored by his university. Of course, the High Court was going to hear this case. Well, that's right. And But you make the very good point, as I alluded to earlier, this is not just a workplace dispute. This is, at a High Court level, this is a test case on the meaning of what academic freedom is, uh, how far these protections go. You know, is free speech the content of what you say or is it how you say it? Um, this is this is a change in the law we're talking about here. This is uh, this will set a precedent that will be embedded in the Australian common law, uh, hopefully forever. So depending on, depending on the outcome, of course. Um, but Bella, you know, this isn't just about Peter, obviously. This is, we have to understand the Peter Ridd case from, against the backdrop of the broader monoculture and censorship that's happening at universities. So what hangs in the balance here? There's a lot on the line. Um, this, this is much more than just a case about Peter Ridd. This is a case about free speech in, in our universities, which mm. has long been eroded. You know, in the last few years, we've seen a litany of examples of academic students and, and visiting speakers yeah. who have been deplatformed and silenced because they're saying something that doesn't um, align with the orthodoxy and accepted point of view. Yeah. And I, it's, it's why it's interrupting, but it's much more right. than free speech at universities. It's free speech in Australia in general. This is, this is not just the university sector. It's, it's, mm. it's basically affecting um, how people can um, conduct themselves in Australian society. It's, it's this cancel culture that is engulfing our society and it comes straight from the university. So it's, it's yeah. very symbolic. Well, it does come from the universities because because a lot of these intellectual trends, this uh, idea of safe spaces of you know, taking offence at absolutely anything, this um, you know, uh, critical race theory and post structuralism. I mean, it does matter because it gets into the boardroom, it gets into uh, the media, it gets into the culture at large. Uh, so to use this case to push back against that council culture and actually make universities live up to their job and their their function by allowing for all speech, no matter how controversial or unpopular it is. Uh, I think you're right. I think it will, um, you know, they say politics is downstream from culture and a win in the Peter Ridd case may be the tipping point we need to actually restore freedom of speech and honest debate on a lot of things, not just um, climate change. But um, even we're told sort of listen to the science uh, and respect the science, listen to the experts and so on. Yet the very same universities that... Um, say, listen to the science, the same expertocracy are shutting down a qualified, respected academic uh, dean of physics at James Cook University, respected in his field, uh, all because he went against the grain on, you know, admittedly, a politically loaded area of science. If we can win this case and win in the High Court, do you think it will go some way to dismantling what I call science worship, not respecting the scientific method, but just taking the word of official experts and and bulldozing anybody who claims otherwise. Absolutely. It's clear from the universities and the media as well, there are a certain element in our society that just want one particular view on climate change and they don't want to even want to debate at all. Mm. And I think what's telling about this case is, is that JCU have never once tried to rebut the no. claims that uh, Peter Ridd honestly made about the Great Barrier Reef and the science research coming mm. out of JCU. Yep. If they were open, if they were up for the debate, like a university should be, yeah. they would be, uh, you know, trying to rebut those claims. They would try, be trying to um, debate with Peter Ridd on the facts, on the science. But that, I think it's very telling that they've never tried to do so. That's a good point because uh, this case originated because a gentleman named Terry Hughes, who heads up the Centre for Excellence in Coral Reef Studies at JCU, complained about a comment Peter made to a journalist saying that 
the research showing the Great Barrier Reef is dying is basically junk research. It's bad science. Is there a problem with our universities that rather than Terry, you know, Terry Hughes could have come out publicly and, and vitriolically if he wanted to and said Peter Reid is wrong because of X, because of Y and everything else. Rather than do all that, uh, Terry Hughes went straight to the dean and made a complaint and that triggered a disciplinary, disciplinary proceeding. I mean, do you think this is what's going wrong with the universities that academics are defaulting to, you know, leg, legalistic solutions here, not actually the spirit of open debate, even even difficult debate and, and hostile debate, but debate nonetheless. Yeah, I think you're right. I mean, debate in universities has long since disappeared. Yeah. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, you know, if you're a, a speaker from somewhere else, you can't really you can't really appear at the university if you say something that's not in line with orthodoxy. Yeah. Um, and um, and this leads me to to commend the the, the current um, education minister, Alan Tudge, who's mm. actually taking it very seriously. And he understands the how integral freedom of speech is to the operation of university, of a successful operation of university. Mm. Um, and he's making all the right noises. You know, he's um, actually approaching the, the chancellors and saying, uh, I think you should really consider signing um, signing the, the French code. He's not he's not com compelling them to, yeah. but he's actually saying, you know, this is a really good idea. This is this is a really good step in the right direction for for improving the situation that and, we're finding And, and to mm. follow up from that, and to credit the Morrison government, mm. next week in the Senate. Uh, we'll decide on the Higher Education Amendment Free Speech Bill, yeah. which former Education Minister Dan Tean said if that had have been in place uh, around the time that Peter Reid was dismissed, mm. they wouldn't have been able to do so. Yeah. Um, so that is, that is very exciting news. And hopefully the Senate uses this decision that the High Court mm. made to hear this appeal to instantly or immediately pass that bill. That's right, actually. You're right insofar as it had the court not given leave today and not agreed to hear the case uh, and not allowed it to go further, that would have been basically the end of the road for Peter. And because they haven't, because they've actually said, no, this is an important area of law that's in the public interest to consider, you're right, that actually might give more impetus to move along these reforms that you've mentioned. But, I mean, this is amazing, though. I mean, why have the university, why do the universities have to be dragged kicking and screaming to allow for free speech and open debate? Why do we need the French Code? Why do we need uh, bills like this? I mean, shouldn't... I mean, look, we're stating the bleeding, bleeding obvious here, but shouldn't they welcome... Debate. Why have we got? Why has it gone to the stage we're at uh, for, for either of you, uh, but perhaps for Bella? Why are we at the stage where we have to force universities to actually hear other opinions out? Oh, look. I mean, it's been going on for a long time. This idea that there's just there's this one way of looking at the world, yeah. um, and it, it, I, I personally have been looking at the humanities over the last four years, and you can mm. trace it down to there. Like they've just got this singular worldview of identity politics, critical race theory. Mm. Um, no other no other views are, are permitted. Um, even though you know they, they'll call, they'll talk about diversity and a diversity of opinion. That's it doesn't complete. mean diversity. Of no, thought. not at all. Not it means at all. Diversity, diversity skin of expression. Yeah, and yeah, that's right. That's Correct. right. Yeah. Um, so you know, it's a very good question. Why? Why has it got to this? How have we let it get to this point? Yeah, um, I think I think it's because the academia doesn't put about premium on the values of Western civilization on free speech. Free well, speech is violence. Uh, free speech is problematic in some circles. And we're seeing that come out with uh, students' responses too. We did a survey of young yeah, people at the IPA. We found true. that over half of young people at universities are afraid to speak up yeah. uh, when in a tutorial room, when a lecture theatre, when there's other uh, views going on, they, they feel like they need to uh, self-censor. That's not a criteria we should be looking at for our students going into university. They should be able to openly and freely debate. So drawing it all back to Peter Reid now, uh, Evan, we released research yesterday at the IPA that's showing that under the net zero target that the Prime Minister is basically adopting, uh, you know, another thing that sadly Scott Morrison has folded on, uh, there are up to 650,000 jobs at risk in Australia from a net zero emissions target. And any questioning of that at all is uh, basically knocked aside because, well, you know, the climate science says this and we have to act now, otherwise the world will end in 12 years and Greta Thunberg will be upset, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, do you think that a win for Peter Ridd might allow or do something for a more honest and open debate on climate change where we can have a proper discussion of, at the very least, the costs and benefits of chucking up to 650,000 people out of work? It should, because you, you see what they're doing, you see what the media are doing, you see what the universities are doing. It, it starts with climate change science, yeah. and all of a sudden there's a bubble around that, you can't discuss that. And then it's the practicalities, it's the economics around climate change that's yep. not up for debate. Correct. And so they're moving on to that now. Next, it'll be different areas like economics, like workplace relations, like all the other things yeah. where you actually can't have a civilised debate without questioning the motives of the other side. Peter Ridd's pointed out uh, some really good research mm. about how 
the farm runoff has nothing to do with the damage around the That's Great right. Barrier Reef, mm. but, but JCU and others keep promoting the same things. You can't have a debate about that, no. and he's tried to shine a light on that as well. Well, look, it, we've come a long way. Uh, we're heading into the fourth quarter now, and I think we're up. Uh, but look, let's hope that we get the outcome we, we want here and that we need here because uh, this is pivotal. This is so important to not just the future of climate science and the climate debate, not just to the future of our universities and the higher education education sector, but as you guys have uh, pointed out today, to the, the very way in which we conduct debates in this country, the, the, the premium we put on free speech. Uh, this is a Peter versus Goliath battle and uh, we'll be going all guns blazing and doing whatever we can to uh, to help the war effort. And we'll be doing whatever we can to help you uh, stay updated and stay up to date with what's happening uh, with the Peter Ridd case. We will be doing a very, very extensive coverage of the Peter Ridd uh, hearing when it gets to the High Court, hopefully later this year. Uh, but in the meantime, please follow along at ipa.org.au uh, for regular updates on the Peter Ridd case. Uh, and thank you for tuning in today.